One of the foremost authorities on, on vote fraud and what can be done about it is our next speaker, Lynn Landis, who also publishes the online Landis Report. Lynn, come tell us about it. I guess it's almost good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Lynn Landis. Uh, I've been writing about uh, vote fraud and the voting system since 2002. Uh, before that, though, let me, let, let me give you some background on myself. Uh, I graduated from Temple University in, back in 1976 with a degree in political science. And as a speaker before uh, me had indicated, I learned almost nothing, really, about politics or voting, having attended Temple University. And I think in most universities, you're going to learn next to nothing about the real story of uh, voting and voting systems in this country. Uh, why that is, is I think the same reason why they don't read the Constitution. Because they really don't want you to understand that your vote really doesn't count. What you get on election night is circumstantial evidence of what you did. You do not get direct evidence of having voted at all, except in a few communities, like in New Hampshire. Twenty percent of the electorate in New Hampshire votes on paper ballots and hand counts them at those precincts. They're, they're the closest to true transparency in voting that we have in this country. That also goes on in select communities across the nation. But for 95% of the voters, they vote remotely, privately, secretly. They vote on machines, they vote absentee, they vote early, and in some cases, when they vote by paper ballots and hand counts, those paper ballots are actually not counted at the polls. They're counted at central counting facilities. So what is transparency in voting? I'd like to give you an example. Let's pretend it's your choice. They're going to repaint this room. So you've got two color choices. You've got blue and green. So how many people would vote for painting this room blue? Please raise your hands. OK, and how many would vote for green? OK, let's pretend we had the time to count up all those hands. And 65 or 60% 60 voted for green. 40% uh, voted for blue. And that was duly noted. That's total transparency in voting. That's what it is. Let me give you some background on the history of voting in this country. At the beginning, uh, when we first uh, declared our independence and wrote up our Constitution, voting was for white men with property. By the time we got to the Civil War, voting uh, became for most white men, with some exceptions, some immigrants weren't allowed to vote. But after the Civil War, the powers that be knew that uh, African Americans were going to be allowed to vote, and eventually women as well were going to be allowed to vote. So three things happened after the Civil War. In the 1870s, they began to allow absentee voting. Before that, voting was simply on Election Day, and it was completely public. So in the 1870s, it started with absentee voting uh, for the military only, and that's generally how they get their foot in the door. Today, they're allowing electronic voting, um, uh, email voting for the military. That's the foot in the door. In the 1880s, they began to um, require secret ballots. What is a secret ballot? A secret ballot is an anonymous ballot. It's an anonymous ballot that you hand off to an election official who, in fact, can count it pretty much any way they want. And it really makes recounts, post-election recounts and audits, unverifiable. So that was the 1880s, secret ballots. And that came to us from Australia. In 1856, that's where it originated. And in the 1890s, they introduced voting machines. It's been that long ago. And those three things taken together really closed the curtain on transparency in elections. So by the 1930s, most urban areas had voting machines. And by 1964, cynically, when the Civil Rights Act was passed, and in 65 when the Voting Rights Act was passed, 
That was the exact time they introduced computer vote counting with ballot scanners. Also, very interestingly, in 1964, is where they introduced the exit poll. The exit poll was just one poll. That poll was uh, controlled by the major news networks, along with, at the time, the Washington Post and the New York Times. The public didn't know that for many, many, many years, if not decades. They did not realize that the networks were controlling that exit poll. But what that exit poll was used for was to support rigged election results. So for some of my friends in the voting security community who say those exit polls were always right, of course they were always right, because at the end of the day, they were always matched to the so-called official election results. So what are we going to do now? Because a lot of people are becoming increasingly aware that uh, the voting machines and the, um, even the ballot scanners can't be trusted. And, and actually, the situation today is 80% of all votes are electronically counted, either by the touchscreen machine uh, or by computerized ballot scanners. 80%, well, 95% actually percent are, are processed by machines. 80% of all those votes are controlled by two companies, uh, ES&S and Diebold. Those two companies were in fact started by two brothers, Bob and Todd Yurosevich. And in, in fact, in the, in the situation with ES&S, one of the major uh, contributors is the Rothschild Group. Now, it's interesting because um, the exit polls that started with this computer voting are not only uh, controlled by the news networks, but also the Associated Press. Who owns the Associated Press? Well, Reuters does. And who owns Reuters? The Rothschilds. <laughs> Who's on the Federal Reserve? The Rothschilds. You know, and other banking interests. It's not just them. But there's a definite connection between banking, voting, exit polls, and the media, and the fact that we've got a bunch of crooks in Congress. And these guys are not going to give up what they've earned illicitly freely. They're just not going to do that. And how do we know? Because those of us who've been fighting this battle have gotten zilch help from the Democrats. It's been very superficial what, and, and nothing from the Republicans. Because during these elections that we have studied and we've seen the flips, almost always irregularities, in fact, I can say always irregularities, favor I would say the free trade party uh, uh, candidate of either party. I don't want to use the word conservative because it really doesn't make sense. So, um, in the primary that uh, Pat Buchanan was in against Bush, you, would, you might consider him the most conservative candidate. But evidence was that the election was rigged against him. And the reason why was he's not a free trader. So, so this, is, this is basically what we have. All the voting rights groups and the civil rights groups, including the NAACP, ACLU, um, Jesse Jackson's uh, Rainbow Coalition, even Ralph Nader has very little to say about this subject. So those of us who've been fighting this battle are really on our own. Uh, it, it's, it has to be a grassroots fight because the media has a, pretty much of a blackout on this whole situation. And, and you might say, you might ask, well, Obama, you know, he got elected. Well, Obama was interestingly unconcerned about this issue as well. He seemed to know he didn't have anything to worry about. But other people have. And the evidence is still there. There was vote flipping in the early uh, voting uh, states. And many of the states have early voting. Voters were watching their uh, votes flip from, from uh, McCain from Obama to McCain, right in front of their eyes. This has happened in the last several elections. The machines are actually showing people what they're doing. I don't know what's up with that, except uh, the people who, you know, these, these machines do have a couple of different manufacturers. Uh, why would they all be doing the same thing? And some of us have theorized it's basically to discourage us from voting at all. So, that's where we're at, is that uh, the voting system is controlled by a couple of corporations. They use secret software, 
even if the software was open source, it wouldn't matter. And they're self-regulating. There is no one really checking this software out. So where do you go from there? Well, one thing I did back in 2004 is I filed a lawsuit. I filed a federal lawsuit challenging the constitutionality. <laughs> I sued the um, city commissioner uh, of uh, Philadelphia, the Secretary of State of Pennsylvania, and the Attorney General of the United States. And I filed it in federal court. I did it pro se. I did it myself because, frankly, I figured the lawyers are probably not trained any better than I was trained as a political scientist. So I decided to do it myself and ended up in the oldest library in the, uh, library in the country uh, on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, which is where I live. Um, so. What I did was I challenged the constitutionality of using voting machines or absentee voting, also early voting, central counting facilities, anything that interrupted the transparency of the process. Um, and there was a lot of evidence to, to show that this was a completely unconstitutional uh, route. But having sued at the uh, district level and then gone up to the appellate level, and then finally I, I filed with the Supreme Court it really didn't matter. The arguments they used against me was, were so absurd that it was, they were just dismissing me out of hand because they knew I would get no real publicity for what I was doing. So they basically threw it out on standing. Apparently, as a journalist and as a citizen, and even, even I had been previously a, a candidate for office, you have no standing to sue for the right to watch votes being counted. Uh, one of the pieces of evidence I used in the, um, in the in the lawsuit was an email I'd gotten from um, a, uh, the, the woman at the federal level in charge of training uh, federal observers. And I had asked her the question, well, how can you tell the votes are being counted accurately if, if you know, they're being counted in a machine? And she said, well, you can't. And she, she said, what the federal observers basically do is come in and watch a recount uh, after, after the fact. And I looked further uh, into this situation, and um, you know, I, I have to stop and say one book everyone should read, and it's a book I read, published in 1993, was the book Vote Scan, The Stealing of America by the Collier Brothers. That it really set the template for everything I'm saying to you today, because I followed their footsteps. They were the first ones to notice the, uh, the relationship between the exit poll and uh, election results, and the news networks and the Associated Press the non-enforcement of voting rights, uh, all of that, uh, Jim and um, uh, James and Ken Collier uh, did all that original footwork. Uh, the other group that also raised the red flag on this were computer scientists across the country. And back in 1991, I happened to meet um, the woman now who is the uh, leading authority on computer security in, in the world, really, is Dr. Rebecca Mercury. She and I were uh, Democratic committee people together in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I went on to become the chair of the party, and she came up to me one day and said, you know, uh, she said, we're having a, a, a real concern, um, myself and other computer scientists across the country, about um, this increasing um, electronic computerization of the vote. And in our county, they wanted to replace the lever machines with touchscreen machines. And so I said, well, that sounds that sounds like it's pretty important. Me, the political science major, had never really considered this. I never even considered the fact that the lever voting machines could be easily rigged. So, um, so we supported her, she did her thing. Um, I ran for office, didn't do too badly, but basically the opposite party had control of the warehouse where the lever voting machines were housed. So who knows how I would have done if it was a paper ballot hand count election. Time passed and uh, we lost track of each other. Rebecca moved away and um, in the t when the 2000 election started to implode, whose name is on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer and several other newspapers, but now she is Dr. Rebecca Mercury. And she got her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in voting machine security. During that decade of the 90s, I had really focused most of my efforts on trash and waste and environment and, health and you know when this started coming about I thought you know maybe this is more important 
Because maybe the reason I'm, I'm not getting anywhere, many of us aren't getting anywhere with environmental protection, is because our votes don't count. So that started my investigation into all of this. Rebecca would not look into, she wanted to keep her mind pure and not want to go into the, you know, what was up with these companies. But she directed me to some sources, and that's when I started writing about it. My second article on the subject was called uh, Elections in America, Assume Crooks Are in Control. And I still stand by that title. After writing that, uh, that sort of tongue-in-cheek piece, because all I did was I, I just looked up who the voting machine companies were. I went to their websites, noticed you know, they had all these banking connections, and uh, one was foreign-owned uh, by um, a, a group in Ireland that was connected with the lottery, and it was, it was all kinds of things connected with money. Uh, some Sequoia, uh, there was another one that was foreign-owned, um, multinational corporations, and I'm thinking, well, who's watching the store here? Anything could happen. Um, so as getting, going on to, though, part of what Vote Scam addresses, is the absolute non-enforcement of federal law. And they mentioned this guy named Craig Donsanto. Craig Donsanto um, got the position as the director of the voting integrity section of the Justice Department back in 1970. And despite the, the mountainous evidence of vote rigging to do with these machines, he has never investigated one incident. And he's still there today. He's what we call a gatekeeper. He's not going to investigate anything. Whenever you hear of investigations, and they generally like to call it voter fraud, it's, you know, listen to the news media. They talk about voter fraud. They don't talk about election fraud or vote fraud, or often not very much about these companies. But they like to talk about voter fraud as if a bunch of people are you know, racing into precincts to rig the election or hack into the election. So when, even if we had the best laws on the books, if you've got somebody in an office where both parties seem to be content with his not looking into this issue at all, despite, you know, an uproar, an increasing uproar over it, then what are you left with? What do you do when there's no enforcement? So that's Craig Don Santo. So that, that leads us to what do you do, what are the solutions, and uh, so I wrote this article in 2005 called Plan B, Parallel Elections, and I, I wrote it and I really didn't follow my own advice for a year or two, but other people did in California, Texas, Ohio, and this is the idea. If they're not going to count our votes, then we'll count our votes, and, and what I suggested was on election day, stand outside the poll and, you know, give people literature on their way in and tell them you're going to ask them how they voted and you want them to sign so that you have, a, 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 you have direct evidence, as direct evidence as you can as to how people voted. And then you add it up and you do a, you know, a comparative analysis and see what happens. So um, some groups, what they did is they didn't want to ask people to sign uh, the ballot. They thought that was too intrusive. They still believe the secret ballot is protecting you instead of opening the door to vote fraud. So uh, instead they had people sign a log. But it was very interesting. In my experience when I finally did it, it was very interesting because people wanted more than anything for their vote to count. More than anything they wanted their vote to count. Well, uh, someone else did this who's kind of famous in our circles. Uh, his name's Clint Curtis. And he's a programmer who, um, back in 2005, uh, the Speaker of the Florida House, uh, Tom Feeney, uh, was employed uh, as a lobbyist uh, at the same time by Yang uh, Enterprises. And Yang is a computer firm that had contracts with NASA and uh, the Florida Department of Transportation, that sort of thing. And Clint Curtis worked for him, for them. Actually, the president of Yang was a, um, a Chinese woman whose brother had already been deported for um, state secret problems. So, so he was, he, Tom Feeney and, 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 and Clint Curtis's boss approached Clint Curtis to uh, develop a program that would flip an election. And Clint thought this was just practice. He, he thought it was just to prove a point, uh, how easy they could be flipped. And uh, so he did it, but he, 
the next day he comes in, it doesn't take two seconds, but to write up a program like this, and he said, um, well, this is a joke, right? And his boss says, you don't understand. We're actually going to flip an election. He's like, well, what are you, a crook? <laughs> so he left. And he went public with it. And, um, oh, so at any rate, uh, when he ran for office, um, he decided, he, he eventually decided to run against Tom Feeney for Congress. And uh, what he did was he ran a parallel election at certain precincts. Uh, unfortunately, he let uh, the public and, and everyone know what those precincts were. So in those precincts, he, uh, in fact, uh, there was no difference between official results and his results. Backing, tracking a minute, because I see I'm supposed to stop. I'm sorry, just another two minutes. Um, so what, uh, what, he, uh, what the situation was, was in the pre-election, the pre-election surveys that he took, and John Zogby, he was supposed to be neck and neck with Tom Feeney. But at the end of the day, he lost by 16 percentage points. So he realized, even though at the polls where he had notified everyone, you know, that this is what was going to happen, the citizen audit, parallel election, that's where they didn't rig the machines. So it was after his election, for the next six months, he went door to door, uh, targeted 10 precincts, and found out that the official results uh, varied from his results by 12 to 24 percentage points. So the, 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 the story is this, even if it looks like your candidate lost by a landslide, there is no evidence of that as long as you're voting secretly, remotely, by machine, and privately. And I want to thank you for your attention.